Ramona and welcome to Ramona Interviews. And with me in the chair is Mary M. Bennett. She is the director of the Men and Women's Anger Management Program at UMass. We're welcoming her back. This is our next installment. And we're going to use the example that we used before. So we hope that you caught that uh, last show. And we're going to roll it into a more in-depth topic, or a couple of topics, actually. Welcome, Mary. Hi. Good to be here. Thank you yeah. so very much. Um, so to open up this topic, mm -hmm. and you may have to rephrase my sentence a little bit, but what are some of the barriers that prevent people from having effective um, communication and effective communication when they're angry? Mm -hmm. um, well, there are certainly uh, conditions that can make it difficult for us to be in good emotional control that we need to talk about. Those are certainly uh, barriers that can kind of get in the way that are real, that we need to be aware of. And they're all treatment issues. You know, we're focusing on anger. Uh, um, the program does that, uh, that I run. Mm -hmm. um, but essentially what we're talking about is nonviolent communication skills. And that is what um, we're going to be focusing on here today so that how we can get our needs met without verbal or physical aggression. And in our last segment, we talked and focused on, and it's very important to notice that it really is our thoughts that are generating our feelings. Mm -hmm. And we did this exercise that helped us make the connection between our thoughts, our feelings, and our behaviors. And it's not an easy thing to do to connect the feeling that we're having to the thought to notice whether that thinking is true or not. And there are very, there are things that can be going on with us that are real. Uh, some forms of mental illness certainly can get in the way of our thinking. Mm -hmm. And depression certainly is, is one. You know, we can have a major depression and that's uh, um, hard to function. Uh, we may not be able to uh, feel motivated to do much when we are in a, mo uh, in, in a major depression. And I could uh, talk about, you know, uh, more about the symptoms. Certainly people tend to isolate more, they're less social. Are there um, levels of depression? Yes. Uh, there's, uh, major depression is really uh, something that is... Uh, um, significant and there are a lot of a lot more distortions in thinking I think about self too you know feelings of worthlessness and hopelessness those kinds of uh, feelings and the thoughts corresponding thoughts mm -hmm. uh, that go along with that that really color our perception and that are going to make us grouchier too you know that it's going to make it more likely that we're going to respond with some kind of anger this thymic disorder is a more chronic um, uh, milder depression and uh, with any kind of depression of course we can get suicidal thinking and uh, maybe even act out on that which um, any kind of suicidal thinking or homicidal thinking um, those are medical emergencies in my book you know that really need immediate attention and that's very important to be saying that and are there telltale signs for that I mean is it different in a teen than in an adult well, I think with all people, I, well, there's, there is a difference. That with children, I think they, they aren't, don't have the kind of skill um, to be able to talk about it in the way that an adult uh, can. But that doesn't mean that adults do okay. either, you know. Um, but um, a d very, very serious um, um, illness to have depression, for sure. And we need to be aware of these things, that anybody can, you know, be sad, and that's certainly normal, um, uh, a grief response, that's normal, you know, but when it goes on for a longer period of time, these are treatment issues. Same thing with anxiety. You know, anxiety is, uh, uh, you can have uh, various kinds of anxiety disorders, you can have a general anxiety disorder where you just feel kind of... Um, uh, the kind of anxious feelings that you have kind of color everything and this kind of constant worry. Um, and you may have more specific, like panic disorder, um, panic, panic attacks. Is a panic attack very, very specific? 
Like well, you don't have it in one instance in with one setting in one place, but then you may not have it. Like if, if you had a panic attack to fly, it would only be to fly. It wouldn't be on a bus Oh, that would or be a, a phobia. Car. Oh, that, that would be a that phobia. Would be a phobia. Okay. Uh, you know, and a phobia is only a phobia when it starts interfering with your life, and that falls under the anxiety disorders too. Okay. You know, so and and none of this is cut and dry. You know, there's a lot of you know you can have combinations of, and that getting a, a proper diagnosis can be complicated. And and you know, there's also obsessive compulsive disorder. You know, I think the, the show Monk kind of helped everybody understand and other yeah. managing anxious feelings. You know, and uh, and then post-traumatic stress disorder. And that's very, very important, and of course that became um, known uh, because of people's experience, particularly Vietnam, taught all of us what post-traumatic stress disorder is. My father was in World War II, and uh, um, I think he had post-traumatic stress disorder from my memory, you know, of him. And, but it wasn't something that he could own, you know. He says, oh, no. He says so that, and that was pretty typical for that time. Uh, but now we understand that post-traumatic stress disorder is real and mm -hmm. that it does cause um, um, these other kind of uh, symptoms that have to do with the trauma. And uh, people are, are definitely having more problems with impulse control. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, um, you know, this, this, all it takes is one traumatic event. You know, there are um, limits to what we can endure mm -hmm. as people. Yeah. And war is generally traumatizing. That doesn't mean that everybody's experience of traumatic events will turn into full-blown mm -hmm. post-traumatic stress disorder. I had a car accident and I had flashbacks after that. But that left me after a period of time. You know, so there are these conditions that we need to be aware of, and trauma in particular, because this trauma response, it, when we met last time, we were talking about noticing that our thoughts are causing us to feel a certain way. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine being depressed and anxious and having these other experiences of uh, trauma, whether it's sexual abuse or physical abuse as a child, these kind of, of, uh, of unspeakable events mm -hmm. that we don't then have access to our own feelings. That's mm -hmm. very hard to, and we need to be able to uh, talk about uh, what's gone on. That's part of the healing process, you know, to give ourselves permission to speak. But it also needs to be safe to do, and we need part of what we do in the program that we run is to create that kind of an environment to make it possible that people can feel safe, you know, talking particularly in, whether we're talking about whether it's a woman's group or a men's group, mm -hmm. that people feel safe to talk about what is going on. And uh, that is very powerful, that yeah, uh, the connection that they make with you and the connection that they make with each other, mm -hmm. you know, that they can talk about and hear, oh, somebody else has had this kind of an experience, that in and of itself is healing. So the, so the anger that someone may feel towards not getting their way or not having their child pick up their room, mm -hmm. that's easy. then becomes ultra-personalized because the person has an, a, a trauma or a reaction from a trauma that has become depression or that has become a phobia or that has become an anxiety. In other words, okay. if, if you have someone that does not have these underlining things chronically, uh -huh. and then in someone who doesn't and someone who does, right. the person who doesn't is going to experience, anger is going to experience the five things that you talked about yeah. uh, uh -huh. with, when dealing with their anger. Uh -huh. But if you have these underlying, but the person who has the underlining uh, chronic issue as well, then everything becomes more intense? Yes, very good job. That's exactly what happens. The intensity just goes up so that when we're hit, uh, we need to talk about the wave of emotion that when we are upset. Uh, the first half of our program is talking about just that, the fact that when we are upset, we get these arousal states go up, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. it, it is. We can track it. It's, it's, it's this wave, and what we want to be able to do in our job as an adult is to be able to stay with that and not react. Right. And there are other skills like taking timeouts, mm -hmm. noticing, step back. How mm -hmm. do we step back? How do we get back into our wise adult mind? Mm -hmm. It's very important. All of these things take skill.
Yeah, practice. Know, and practice, right, right. And you need a safe place to begin to yeah. start to do this. So um, our program can provide something like that, right. So there is the intensity that you're talking about, that, you're, that there is this wave of emotion. And to be able to <sighs> breathe, gets oxygen back into our brain, that yeah. helps to break that flight or fight response, because that is what that wave of emotion is about but Tyrannosaurus rex isn't coming down the road. You know, mm -hmm. the, uh, whatever experiences that we had. But it might know, feel that way. It may feel that way. And when, uh, all that may really be going on is, you know, is your son didn't mm. pick up a cleanup, you right. know, for example. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, that's what's really going on. But all this other stuff is with you. Mm -hmm. And that can um, trigger this... Uh, much more intense uh, feelings. So that's, that's very important for people to understand and uh, that they develop. And part of the exercise that we did last time was uh, looking at the kind of distortions in our thinking and noticing that those are accentuated uh, from trauma experiences in particular, right? Yeah. And the depression itself and anxiety and uh, those things. Is there a different toolkit for a person that might be more prone to anxiety or a person who is depressed who has uh, is chronically depressed or a person I mean under each do they use a different skill set because it's so intense or is it just the same skills with well there more are different awareness? treatments for uh, you know for depression and for anxiety disorder for our purposes what we're doing is noticing what is going on with some tenderness mm -hmm. you know just the very fact that we slow it down and notice what we're feeling Ah, look what's going on. This is what I feel. Right. You know, look, I'm, I'm having these thoughts. Where did this come from? Yeah. You know, and we're noticing some of this, you know, might have come from what we learned, you know, as we were being raised, of what we saw, you know, mm -hmm. some of that we covered last time. Yeah. Something's going on with me, mm -hmm. and, you know, what is it that I'm feeling? What is it that I'm needing? And what am I going to do about it? Now we're talking about the components of nonviolent communication. So what am I feeling? Mm -hmm. What do I need? Mm -hmm. And what am I doing? What are you going to do about it? What am I going to do about it? Right. It's okay. really feeling, um, needing, and what am I going to do? What? It, what? Yes. And you know, and how you approach this in a way that you're not going to be resorting to the verbal or physical aggression. Okay. Uh huh. And so, actually, the first part of nonviolent communication, this is Marshall Rosenberg, um, nonviolent communication. He actually has a book by that name, and we use that in the program as a way of being assertive. Mm -hmm. You know, I certainly don't want people acting in ways that are passive, that's eating your feelings and not talking about them. Oh, well, that's you know? a good way to get an also. Yes, indeed. <laughs> it's, it's very unhealthy. Yeah. yeah. And also passive aggressive. You know, that's also not particularly healthy or honest. And, and passive aggressive would be, um, I'm angry because that person did something, so I'll show them by doing something else that's unrelated. Spending well, their money or... That would be passive aggressive. Yeah. Long time and in many other cultures, and you know, there aren't that many places in the world where women have rights. That's very true. You know, so, you know, passive aggressive strategies might be the only power you have. You know? Right. And then, of course, there's just being aggressive with the verbal and physical aggression, you know, trying to have power over somebody. That's the is, yelling, the screaming, yes, the tentative tantrum. I'm going to make you do, you know, yeah, okay. you know, yeah. you know, making demands, you know. Okay. And there's some people that really get off on that and enjoy it. And that's a whole different level of healing. Yes, yeah, a feedback loop. Mm -hmm. they, somehow they've learned to get satisfaction mm -hmm. from projecting that type of energy? Well, I, you know, there is such a thing as interpersonal terrorism, you know, of this, the bully. I've never heard that before, interpersonal oh. terrorism. Well, you know, yeah, sure, somebody that really enjoys, you know, belittling somebody else. I think that what's scary about bullying in school is that um, um, I think that's part of what starts to develop, you know, that, that, that a, a child can enjoy their, mm -hmm. that kind of power they're having over others. You by know. making someone else feel sad. Sure, sure. You know, yeah. the, the texting nasty things, and we're going to get back at her. A lot of the bullying me. stuff has to do, I think, with a sense of insecurity and maybe some other things that are going on. In trauma response, you know, a lot of things are going on at home. You know, kids are going to either act it out 
uh, act out with uh, with anxiety or some kind of aggression. Mm -hmm. You know, if you can see an angry kid in school, that's usually what's going on. You got to be asking yourself what's going on at home. You know, yeah. and, and that's what teachers are doing. And personal terrorism. Yeah, well, that yeah, that can noticed. happen in in relationships. You yeah. know, with uh, you know that people can take it to that level. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, most of the people that were uh, that we see in our program are are uh, not quite at that level, you know, that they're, uh, that they feel remorse, that they mm -hmm. really um, don't want to continue acting the way they are. There has to be a readiness to change. You can't, if you've got somebody who's really enjoying what they're doing, they're not ready. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's very true. You know? That's true. If they don't find value in the difference, right. if they can't somehow build themselves from the inside out, it's not going to happen. Right, right, right. How do you deal with that? <laughs> well, actually, that's very important. That's frustrating. That's part of that's part of the treatment. You know, having people look at where are you on the readiness to change scale. You know, are you kind of pre-contemplative that you, you know, that you don't even. This isn't a problem. It's your problem. Okay. You know, yeah. and you know, smoking. The smoker initially doesn't think the smoking is a problem. Mm -hmm. I enjoy smoking. You yeah. Know. So what's the big deal? Yeah. Yeah. What's the big deal? I don't want to stop. You know, yeah. it's not a problem for me. You know, and then there's the, well, maybe this is a problem. They're going to con think about it. You know, mm -hmm. I'm contemplating, you know, maybe I need to make, make do something different here, mm -hmm. you know. And, you know, and then the, uh, the other part of that, I'm just cueing myself here, making sure I get all of them, you know. And then maybe we're going to prepare then at that point to make, uh, take some action. And uh, that would be the next phase is mm -hmm. uh, taking action. And then we're going to try and maintain that. Uh, by our behaviors, and then after a while, we've made that change, and you know, uh, uh, we're uh, now you're moving into something ex else. Exactly, ex which okay. is what we're doing. So let's get back to the nonviolent communication sure. skills, okay? Yeah. So, um, as I recall, uh, last time you were telling me that um, that there were some things that Jeremy did that you had some feelings about. Yeah, it doesn't clean his room. It doesn't do his chores. Uh, okay. <laughs> okay. 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 Has to be reminded to do uh -huh. his chores. If okay. you remind him, he will do them. Okay. So let's just take a look at that, okay? okay. Using nonviolent communication skills, all right? Mm -hmm. Which I'm sure you're doing for the most part. But let's just break it down because, as I recall, you were saying something like, I don't know, I said something and it really worked, but I don't know how, what I did and I want to be able to do it consistently. Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. know? Mm -hmm. So let's, let's do that. First thing is how to make an observation. Sometimes observations are very important. Sometimes we don't need to make them. But we need to know how to make an observation. And an observation, a real observation, is where that we have a starting point where everybody can, both parties can agree. Mm -hmm. You know, this is the same if we're going to settle things on a larger scale or a small scale between individuals. You know, that you have, what are the facts? You know, this, you know, so you start with, you know, the towels are on the floor. Mm -hmm. Okay, that would be a fact. Okay. Okay? Yeah. Okay. And the second is, how do I feel about this event? Mm -hmm. And what feelings do you have when you... When he doesn't do his chores? Yeah. Um, like, I, well, like, I'll have to do it? Well, that fe that's a, now that's a thought. Oh, that's a There's thought. a difference oh, between okay, a okay. feeling and a thought. Feel it. I mean, how do I feel? Uh-huh. Uh, aggravated. Okay. So you feel aggravated. Now we could look at the thoughts, you know, that was the last exercise that we did, and, uh, is that thinking rationally or not, and as I recall, mm -hmm. you did a very good job noticing that there was something that you might be doing that was less rational, mm -hmm. and then you felt more empowered, and you said, oh, I have choices on how I respond, and you mm -hmm. did a good job there. Okay, so this exercise is going to be a little bit different. We're going to go to the need. We're noticing that you're feeling something, and it's because you need something. It is true that the thought generates the feeling. Mm -hmm. This exercise is going to focus on what is it that I need here? I need him to do his chores. Yes, but you need you need <laughs> <laughs> you need him to do his chores, right? It, but you have a very specific need, and I'm going to yeah. guess it may, might be a, a need for order. You, you, yeah. You, 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 okay. Yeah. You know. Yeah. You have you have an, a need for order. Yes. Okay. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. And maybe you have a need for cooperation. Yes, it's very important. And maybe you have a need for consideration. Yeah. Okay. There you go. Okay. So consideration, cooperation, and order. Okay. Yeah, that's good. That sounds like me. 
<laughs> Good job. And it's very important if you're going to be effective that you know yourself that I'm feeling this and I need that. Now you've got language to talk. Okay, yeah. Because you want him, you really want him to get. Remember, this is yours, not him. Right. He, this yeah. is not his need. It's very important to understand. No, apparently that. not because he's still got his clothes. No, it's, it's, <laughs> it, and so, so Jeremy is off the hook. <laughs> He is totally, completely <laughs> okay. off yeah, the hook, yeah. okay? okay yeah. This is yours, you're owning it, and yeah. you're helping him do something yeah. for you that's good. So now you need to say something to him, so that right. very specifically, so you want to say to him, you know, uh, hey, Jeremy, I notice when I see the towels on the floor or whatever is going on, mm -hmm. you know, that um, I feel um, aggravated you know, and I need order. You know, mm -hmm. would you be willing? Now, this is the third component because okay. now you, you've just, you just, that, that's the fourth component, excuse me. So you've, you've told, you've made an observation. Mm -hmm. You know, there's, yep. this is on the floor. You said what you felt. You've told him what you needed. And right. now, you, now you're going into the fourth component where you're saying, would you be willing mm -hmm. to pick the towels up? Mom would be very happy if you did that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now he knows exactly what he needs to do for mm -hmm. you to be happy. Okay. And he's got a choice. It's a very respectful way mm -hmm. of approaching him. Now, okay. what happens if you say, you must pick up those towels? What do you suppose he'd do? Well, depending upon the age, <laughs> given the age that he's in, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. he'd pick them up and grumble. Yeah, right. And so he might do it because there's a threat of, I'm going to lose something. No, that you're, you're trying to get some cooperation from him. That's what you need. Are you also trying to make him see the value? Yes, the I think it really does. you'll because, make him happy? Because, yes, because what you're, you're teaching him is compassion for you. Okay. Because you're teaching him that your feelings and your needs matter. And, and in doing that, you're showing him, how, you're giving him a language how, he, how you can have this conversation one where we can say would you be willing we're not making a demand because we know that demands or nagging is mm -hmm. a turnoff mm -hmm. okay mm -hmm. so we're, we're that, that it is an actual request yep. of this in other words they can say no he's 16 he can say no mm -hmm. and then that opens up a dialogue no why because I want you to I want you to be assertive and I want you to stay with what you're feeling and needing I don't mm -hmm. want you to have to do everything mm -hmm. but he may have a really valid reason why okay. in mm -hmm. which case you know, there's some negotiation. Right. But it's based on his feelings and needs now and your willingness okay. to yeah. listen to him. Okay. So there's this ability to be able to tune into each other at this very important level that there's this, you stay connected. What happens when we get angry oftentimes, when we are angry enough to cross the line, mm -hmm. when we have reached this point of maximum frustration, for okay. example, with something that our kids do that we Mm -hmm. and we perceive that they might be doing something deliberately to us, you haven't actually said that, mm -hmm. you know, but we don't feel like we have any, oh, I can't stand it, you know, I'm going to have to do everything kind of thing, mm -hmm. you know. And we, we often are somewhere in our mind thinking, this person that I care about is somehow a monster in our mind. Mm -hmm. They've become mm -hmm. less in our mind. Okay. We've kind of put them down in our mind. And you don't want to do that to anybody that you care about, right. you know. So we, we, it's very important to stay connected on this level, you know. It really is true, you know, in the case of a partner, for example. I think I've mentioned that on, a, on past shows. We could be making love one minute, and then half hour later, we want to strangle that person. What happened? We changed our mind. We yeah. changed the way we were thinking. Thinking, our mm -hmm. mindset. Right. Yeah. And if you can change it one way, you can change another. Exactly. Exactly. To notice that this is happening with us, yeah. you know, and to stay focused here mm -hmm. so that we can stay effective. I want everybody to get their feelings and needs met. I like that, stay effective. Yes. I like that, I like that expression. Right. Stay I want, you know, and that grabs people into the program. You know, when I'm doing an intake with somebody, I say to them, are you interested in being an effective full-grown adult so that your feelings and needs can get met. You know, just in this brief exercise, the exercise from last show and then this exercise here, it's, mm -hmm. it's really, yeah, were my needs being met and what are my needs right. and then how can I work right. to get those needs met yeah, the and communicate that. Exactly. And I think if, 
if you if you have a healthier uh -huh. relationship mm -hmm. and in time the more you do this the more people will understand it's not a tit for tat it's a I, I genuinely am asking you and then therefore I expect therefore there will be because everybody's kind of in line with each other. Well, hang on, because this is, part of what you, you really are trying to accomplish is that you get them to care about you. Yeah. You're in sales, you know, when you're doing this. <laughs> you're trying to get people to care about your feelings and needs. And you're telling them what they are because you, they can't the, read your mind. The on, exactly. The onus is on you. Your happiness is up to you. The conflicts in the world, uh, we have wonderful examples right now in the world with Tunisia and Egypt and you know people that standing up and you know, learning how to stand up and that's the other part and the last part of nonviolent communication is I will not allow myself to be harmed. Yeah. I'm not going to allow you to talk to me yeah. this way. Yeah. And we have to take that kind of action. And we're doing it in a way that's respectful, there's no verbal or physical aggression, mm -hmm. but we're taking our own feelings and needs seriously. Yeah. And that we really are standing firmly, yeah. Yeah. firm and loving, and loving. Yeah, that's that right. we're not yeah. going to allow someone to knock us over, yeah. right? Yeah. That we are going to say, hey, you know, I'm not letting this happen. And so this is a 20-week program mm -hmm. that we're talking about, uh, and uh, the website? If you Google Anger Management, UMass Medical Center, you'll come right to our website, and we do have some handy things there, timeout techniques, managing conflict safely, that's on our website. That's and great. Uh, we are housed in the, uh, there's this beautiful three-story brick building. It's next to the Beechwood Hotel, mm -hmm. right across that uh, from the main hospital. So outpatient psychiatry, uh, we have our own building there. Mm -hmm. That is uh, a nice safe don't, place. A nice safe place. It really is a nice safe place. Yeah, it is. It's a right. nice building. Right. It feels like a home. Yeah. Yes. You know, I mean, it has offices in it, but it right, has like right, a homey right. feeling. It does. Yeah. It does. Yeah. It has a beautiful history too. It's a, been a part of Worcester for a very long time because yeah. it was a part of the Worcester State Hospital complex. Also, it is very it, old. It, absolutely. Yeah. It's 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 uh, it's uh, and its work continues. And yes, and Worcester and uh, the work that. Many people in Worcester are doing to promote nonviolence is really quite amazing. So I'll give a plug for the Center for Nonviolent Solutions mm -hmm. also, which is a part of Worcester, and you can Google that as well. Yeah. And, uh, and get more tips and ideas. Yeah. And yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Mary, for coming on. Oh, thank you, Ramona. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Yeah. I am Ramona, and you've been watching Ramona Interviews. Have a wonderful week.